In this video, we'll figure out how to capture translations by matrix multiplication in the component space, sort of. And while we're at it, we'll do the same for rotations in the plane with respect to points other than the origin. So rotations that look like this. And rotations in three dimensions with respect to axes that don't pass through the origin. Now what do all of these transformations have in common? What do they all have in common that should make us less than optimistic that it's even possible to express them as matrix products in the component space? Well, it's the fact that they're all not linear. Do you remember the easiest way to tell that they're not linear? Well, it's the fact that all of these transformations apply to the zero vector or do something other than the zero vector. So they break the hallmark property of all linear transformations. Any linear transformation applied to the zero vector produces the zero vector. And neither translations nor rotations with respect to points other than the origin or axes that don't pass through the origin have that property. Let's write down the algebraic definition of a translation. A translation, ah, uh, let's see. A translation applied to vector v is v plus a, where a is the same vector for all the input vectors v. So it's really possibly the simplest transformation that one can think of. It's analogous to simple addition for ordinary numbers. And it just so happens that the simplest possible transformation is not linear. And you can see that it's not linear by testing that hallmark property. Apply this transformation to the zero vector and the result is the vector a, right? Because it's zero plus a. So it's the vector a, which is not zero. So this is not a linear transformation. And by the same principle, neither is rotation with respect to a point other than the origin and the same thing in three dimensions. So there's actually very little hope. There's actually no hope that these transformations can be represented by matrices in the component space. Even if you attempt the standard procedure where you apply the transformation to each of the basis vectors and then re-express the images with the respect to the basis itself and put the components in the matrix, you will get a matrix that in no way represents this transformation. You should go ahead and try. Construct that matrix for this basis and any translation you want, and then see if that matrix really does represent translation. Try applying it to any vector and see if the answer is correct. Try applying it to the zero vector and see if you get the vector A in return. And of course you won't because any matrix times the zero vector is the zero vector, so it fails. It's not the matrix that you want. It's not the matrix that will represent translation with respect to this basis or any other basis. So is it hopeless? Well, it certainly feels hopeless, but we're not ready to give up yet because we are, of course, great fans of matrix algebra. So far, matrix algebra has been able to express all kinds of ideas for us. It was able to express Gaussian elimination. Do you remember how we expressed the steps of Gaussian elimination by products with elementary matrices? That wasn't it. We were able to express all sorts of linear transformations. For example, when it came to polynomials, the first derivative, the second derivative, even the screwy dilation were no problem. And then for geometric vectors, uh, trans, excuse me, rotation, reflection, even projection that we haven't discussed recently and all other sorts of linear transformations, no problem. So are we really going to let this simple transformation trip us up? We can't afford to do that. It's just so attractive to have a uniform language for expressing ideas. And our chosen uniform language is that of matrices. So we can't give it up. And also computers are now tailor-made for working with matrices. They're actually better at multiplying matrices because matrix multiplication is such a common operation that computers and certain parts of, the computer, of computers 
have been specifically designed, hardwired to be fast and efficient at matrix multiplication. We must find a way to take advantage of that power. We're not going to give up all of that power and all of that, let's say, beauty because of this silly transformation that just happens to be nonlinear. So we have to rescue it. And we are going to rescue it with a trick. And here is the trick. The trick is to augment the component space in a very, very simple way. So let's suppose that the vector V has components V1, V2, and V3. And that the vector A has components A1, A2, and A3. So here is the matrix that will represent the translation. And here is the vector V, except there will be an additional entry here. We're going to say V1, V2, V3, and put a 1 here. So it's an augmented component space with a 1 here. And this little tail will drag along for the ride some entries of this matrix, which will result in a translation. So what is this vector translated? Well, of course, it's V1 plus A1, V2 plus A2, and V3 plus A3. So let's write down the desired result. We're going to have V1 plus A1, V2 plus A2, V3 plus A3. And we don't really care what ends up here, but it will work out that it's a 1. And in fact, it's good to have a 1 so that we agree that all of these augmented vectors have the vector itself in the first three entries and then a 1. Okay, so we need now to come up with a matrix such that when applied to this vector, produces this vector. And this matrix is not at all difficult to come up with. And here it is. So to get V1, V2, and V3, we'll put 1s as if it's in a, the identity matrix. Let me just space them a little bit better. It is a square matrix after all, so 1 goes here, a 1 goes here, and this is the first three lines, so I'll do an even better job. 1, 1, there we go. Now I'm kind of pleased with it. And then to achieve this effect, and it will really be this one that will do the desired thing for us. We need to put A1 here, A2 here, and A3 here. And do you see that the result of multiplying this matrix by this vector is, so far we got the first three entries right. Because in the first row we'll have V1 plus A1. In the second row we'll have v2 plus a2 and in the final row we'll have v3 plus a3 so we've succeeded and now we also want to be able to get this one here and of course that's achieved by putting a one here and there we go we have succeeded in getting the vector that we want yes there is a little bit that we sacrifice number one these vectors don't even come from a vector space or from any uh, obvious vector space. You have to add some trickery to make them elements of, the vector space, of a vector space. For example, you would have to redefine what it means to add two of these guys. It would be the same as before in the first three entries, but you would have to say the last entry just stays as a one. Similarly, when you multiply them by a number, so to multiply this vector by the number seven, you would need to only multiply the first three entries by the number seven and leave the one unchanged. So this tail stays as one. And that's the trick that makes matrix multiplication work and amount to translation. So that's the trick. And now let's see what would we do, and that we're going to do in the second part, with rotations. Because we might worry very legitimately that this one will mess up our rotations. So let me show you that actually it doesn't mess anything up. So once again, we're going to multiply the matrix by the vector V1, V2, V3, 1. And suppose we want to rotate it according to the matrix that's given by the 3 by 3 matrix R. So the rotation that we want to affect is given by the 3 by 3 matrix R. Well, the solution 
is to put that matrix R into this three by three block. So R goes here, and then a one goes here. Of course, R can be a dense matrix with nine non-zero entries. These are zeros, and this is a one. And think about what the result is. So consider it in the block, you know, block sense, and you will realize that what goes into the first three entries is essentially R multiplying this vector V, and by V I mean V1, V2, V3, the component space representation of this vector V. And then this one multiplies this one, and once again puts a 1 here. So rotations continue to work. So the price that we pay is worth it. There is a little bit of a price. This is, takes more spaces in the computer. Because there are, let's say, these three zeros right here that are completely useless. Plus this one that never changes that we have to drag along in space, even though we know it's a one. The same thing happens here. We have to drag these zeros along, and we have to drag these zeros along. So in the computer, it may take more space, and it may also take more time, because we're, when we say, tell the computer, multiply this matrix by these numbers, it does have to multiply by these zeros unless it's specifically represented in a way that doesn't take up more space, but that raises the complexity of the representation. All of these inconveniences are worth it because what we were able to do is rescue the matrix paradigm. We still have a one single uniform language for expressing all of the transformations that we're interested in, let's say, in computer graphics. And that language is the language of matrix multiplication and matrices. And one final note. How does this help us represent rotations with respect to points other than the origin? So I'll answer that question, and then you'll do the same in the three dimensions. It's completely analogous. Well, suppose we have to do a rotation with respect to this point by an angle, pick, let's call it alpha. So we're going to do it in three steps, similarly to the approach that we used when we were rotating an object with respect to an axis that pointed in an arbitrary direction. So what we're going to do is apply a translation. Let's say this is given by the vector A right here. The vector A defines the point with respect to which we're doing the rotation. So what we're going to do is bring everything to the origin by the road by a translation. Then perform our rotation, which is very easily multiplication by matrix, and then translate it back. So our rotation with respect to this point, this is not an X, this is just a little cross, is, once again, it has to go from right to left. Translation by minus A, I'm just going to put it as a subscript, followed by rotation by the angle alpha, followed by another translation back to this point. So now we can capture any rotation, whether it's with respect to the origin or not with respect to the origin, with respect to an arbitrary point given by the vector A. We can, we can express all of those translations by matrix multiplication. So yet another respect in which matrix multiplication has been rescued. So there we go. This completes this video in which we figured out how to capture translations and now arbitrary rotations with respect to any or with respect to any point or any axis by matrix multiplication in component spaces.